Why do you dry lumber in the first place? Well, if you live in Georgia and pretty much all over the country, except maybe in Arizona, <laughs> about as dry as you're going to get uh, is about 12%. But if you can get lumber below 22%, you have no risk of developing fungus, and most uh, fungus stain, decay, or rot, or mold, and most uh, bugs won't get it at below 20%. It weighs half the weight of wet lumber. It's twice as strong. It nails and screws better. And it's easier to glue. It holds glue better. And uh, it machines better. Uh, if you try to cut 12% lumber, it has a little bit of the fuzzies on it if it's too wet, which is, you can sand off. But it finishes easier and it was, won't, it will shrink and swell less in environments like your carport or somewhere where you don't have HVAC system, system. So I actually did that uh, uh, mud bench for my brother in air-dried wood. I even glued up panels for it and they, they're doing great. They haven't cracked or anything that's been three years. So it works fine for some applications. Also, some other advantages for it, people that use hand tools a lot, like planes and that sort of thing, find that higher or 12% wood or air dry wood actually planes and works better. Same thing for blades and stuff like that. It's not as brittle. Uh, like I said, it's, it's better in rooms that you don't have HVAC, system, HVAC systems. And it's low cost. Right now, we have, what, 30 cents a board foot in it. Now, I'm going to have to machine it, get it straight lined, and <coughs> In plane, but I have a, a table saw and a planer, so it's going to be the cost of the electricity, but it's not that much. So I won't have that much in this wood, you know, if I use it just air dry. And to get the most out of air drying, if you do this yourself, of course you want to seal the ends as soon as the, the tree is cut. It doesn't really do any good if you wait a day or two. Uh, it might help a little but not much. You really need to do it right after it's cut. And the log is going to be wet when you do that. So it's a little difficult to do. We had quite a bit of trouble doing it. But we have found that even latex paint will work. But they make an anchor seal and stuff like that. You just basically have to wipe it off, wipe it off, wipe it off, and then put it on real quick, and it work, it'll stick then. <clears throat> when you make a stack for it, if you've been to our sawmill demonstrations, we've gone over this, but you really need at least eight inches above the ground before you start your stack. But 12 inches is better. We, we've always just used one row of, of uh, concrete blocks, and that works fine. And that's eight inches. You've got to have dry stickers between them. If you use the same species of wood, you can use stickers that the mill cuts, but it does sometimes create a molding problem. So dry stickers are much better if you can use dry stickers. You want to start with a flat base so you don't uh, program in your wood a bow to begin with or something like that. So I just basically just pull strings on the corner of blocks. It doesn't have to be level flat. It just has to be flat. So uh, just pull some strings and put all the rest of your supports at the same height and the same plane and in good in shape. Particularly when you're first cutting, uh, the wood has like two types of water in it. Free water is the water that's in the capillaries. It's not really bound to the wood. It comes out really fast, probably in less than a week. So you lose probably 30% of all of the water in a week. And we, we found that. 
And that's the reason you see us put those fans in front of it when we first cut them and put stacks up. And we'll put those fans on for how long? Two days. Two days. That's all it took. And all that does, it cuts way down on the mold growth. Because once you kind of dry that wood, the mold doesn't want to grow as much. So that's all you have to do. But you don't want to leave it on there for a real long time because that's too fast. You'll start splitting it. So for a couple of days, though, to get that free water out is fine. And the water that's left in there is, you know, it has two hydrogens and a wood fiber has a lot of hydroxyl groups and you have van der Waals versus there. To, much more difficult to get that out of there. That takes, it'll get down to a 12% in a year. We found even an inch and a quarter. While I was doing my research, I actually ran across something that was very interesting. Uh, this guy is on findwoodworking.com. And it's, this is a really good video describing air drying and actually the kiln process too. But he puts tin on top of the stack. It has a little separator between the top of the stack and the tin. He puts like a little framework there. And he puts up uh, this black uh, plastic here is uh, called shade cloth. And you get that from uh, landscape uh, greenhouse supply stores. I don't know how much it costs yet, but we're going to look into it. So we'd actually not like to do this. Huh? It's not really expensive. Yeah, I've never yeah, used it before, but I thought that's a very clever way to do that. Because when it rains, it'll hit that cloth and it'll keep the rain from hitting the stack, but it still uh, will breathe and everything. I thought that was pretty ingenious. So we're, the wood that's on the trailer now, which is about two-thirds of what we cut last time, we're going to set up like this and, you know, We'll see how it goes. Why not just air dry? Uh, it's still at 12%. We'll get post beetles and uh, and some other insects, but mostly it's post beetles. The below 20% is usually pretty good, but post beetles will get in it even at 12%. And of course, if you just air dry, you will have to fight with stain and mold issues. We found in the past that if we cut our wood in the middle of the winter, uh, of course you don't have much mold growing when it's that cold. It's usually a pretty dry time of year and we don't have near as much trouble with mold. But if you cut in July, good luck, especially with pine or poplar. But, uh, so that's why we try to avoid cutting in the summertime. So it kind of helps that a little bit. But it's more likely to crack if airflow is minimal or exposed to direct sun, in other words, if you don't take your time to do your stacks right, you go too wide, too tall, or maybe even the weather just doesn't like you that year, you'll get a lot more cracking. So having a kiln to kind of speed that up might help that. Uh, less the uh, variabilities of weather. The weather does cause problems sometimes. You can count on 10% loss. Even accounting for after you cut off, you're uh, checking on the end if you didn't get your seal, your uh, end sealed and everything. Even after all that, you will have 10% greater loss. And I find that a good bit. My cutoff end is huge. <laughs> but that's okay. I haven't spent a fortune for this wood, so I'm feeling good. Also, uh, like I said, we've been talking about in the south and pretty much all over the country, except in a really far out west and that kind of stuff, 12% is about what you're going to get. And you can't can do that for inside. A good idea to have a kiln for these uh, these reasons. Anything above 140 will kill the fungus and any insects that are there, including post beetles. So that's what we're going for right now. We definitely want to make sure if we build something, we don't have any little creatures coming out of it at some point. Uh, a carefully controlled environment will definitely speed up the process, especially with heat added, and you'll have much less loss. We don't have to worry about that 10% or greater uh, shrinkage. The quality is greatly improved. And all, we talk about this a lot, but most inside the home spaces, 38% is pretty average for the humidity inside of your home, which means the moisture content in the wood, they've shown this to be that the data for this would be seven to eight percent, seven percent being ideal. 
six percent would work as well, but when you go to six percent, you have some other problems. We'll talk about some more. How long does that take from the time you bring the wood <coughs> into your in, uh, in your home? Your better environment gets at twelve percent. But put it back in my house or somewhere in my shop while I'm running the air and everything. A week. One last question about that. Once it's in your basement, uh, is it necessary to stick it? Yeah. Uh, after it's dry. To 12 percent? Right. Yes and no. Yes, it is if you want it to be consistent. Uh, say if I stack a big old tall stack and I say I want to use 10 of those boards, that first one in the stack is going to be very different from that last one. If I take that in my shop and let, let it get stable or the same for the rest of them, I'm going to have to leave it in there quite a bit longer to make sure they're all the same. But I'm sorry. How often do y'all rotate the lumber? Do we don't. You know, we don't. Yeah. We, we'd love for you to come do it. <laughs> <laughs> we have an open invitation for that. You can have a rotating day. Yeah, oh baby. I'll rotate it a good bit though. I, I end up moving it around more than I really should. But it's an endeavor to move a whole stack of lumber, trust me. Doesn't take that long, but it's a lot of work. Okay. I just thought I'd throw this out there. I read this when I was doing my research. I thought, oh, this is, kind of puts it in perspective. I hate to read it, but I'm going to read it. <clears throat> Oak shrinks 1% for every 3% change in moisture content. MC is moisture content. <coughs> so in our example, if we take a 2 and a half inch wide board, 3 quarter flooring, loses 3% moisture, it changes 1% or 0 0.025 inches. Doesn't sound like much. But for a glue line, if you have six thousandths, you'll not only see it, the glue's not holding in that line. So, say we had a flooring that's 30 feet wide, you know, the width of the board wide, you would be losing four inches over that span. Now do you know why they tell you to bring that flooring in and let it acclimate to your house? Four inches over 30 I feet. I the flooring that they didn't do that. But uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. That's pretty cool. Uh, it puts it in perspective. And you, Lord help if you're 2% high. Okay. There's a lot of options out there for kilns. The first one is really what most industry uses is the old gas fire or electric. There's a lot of ways to heat them, steam, that sort of thing. And then you get complete control. They're very fast. You can go from the tree standing to the market in about three weeks, depending on how fast you can transport it. It's very fast. It can be sized to fit any size operation. Some of these kilns are as big as big buildings. And they can fit thousands and thousands of board feet in there at a time. They're very expensive to build, even in, on a small scale. It produces excellent quality wood, and that's why most industry, this is what they do. Ricky, that second bullet is why a lot of people don't like kiln dried wood. Because they dry it that fast, it gets case-hardened. You get that. <laughs> it gets case-hardened, which means the surface layer is very hard compared to the... And that inside area. water can't get out. Mm -hmm. Because there's just so much ends to get to it. And we don't have a transport system in there, so it just has to get out. When you split it, it's, it's, it's going to get out. Uh, the next one is a dehumidifier kiln. Uh, it works very well. They're very cheap to build. They're a little more expensive to run, but not bad. He told me, or I remember from the class, it's about $30 for a change in your electric wheel for the month. That's not bad. It's the one thing that's a little disadvantage to it, but you get used to them, but it's easier to make a mistake. If you get to 6% and you just, you know, don't want to, you go on vacation that week, when you get back, you've got yourself a mess. You may have ruined every piece in there. Like you say, you get this case hardening if you get it too low, and you can't come back from that. I found this while I was doing my research as well, and I thought this is a very good uh, publication on that type of kiln, but you can see the dehumidifier in the back back there. It's very similar to a solar kiln, but it doesn't have a collector. They'll have to have some sort of heat source in there. Probably the heat from the fans might even be enough. But he has four attic fans in line. Oh, by the way, even with a dehumidifying can, you have to have airflow. 
you have to keep that air moving all the time. But you can use cheapo fans. You don't have you don't have to use anything fancy. Uh, but the motor, uh, the heat from the motor might be enough, depending on how big your stack is, or how much you're trying to drive. It's his very simple design. There's no reason for having the big steep thing on this type of kiln, but you can. But it's very similar to solar, you'll see. Rick, I got, I got a question on that. Sure. If, if you're using those fans, you're also bringing outside air in. It looks no, like no, 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 no. So we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Oh, so they just, they just recirculate. Yeah, you're recirculating <laughs> the air that's inside there. Okay. But you have to have air movement, though. To keep everything even otherwise the middle of the stack won't have uh, will have a very different moisture content than the outside of the stack We're trying to keep it consistent through the stack uh, uh, Ricky, while you're still on that picture getting back to your discussion about the unattended operation where you, you go on vacation for some time if you're faced with having to leave the thing for some period of time like two weeks what, what's a good way to do that Turn it off. Turn it off. Sure. Not going to hurt it for it to sit. Not funny. Uh, as long as it's low enough, you don't have a mold. I mean, you don't want to turn it off the second day you put it in there. <laughs> but if you're getting pretty close, you can turn it off. I'm not hurry. But if you're in a hurry and you just forget to turn it off and leave, you, you can really mess up. Okay. This is the best one I like. Uh, a lot of guys will go buy these old decompression chambers from the Navy. You know, they sell them dirt cheap. And uh, they'll make one of these kind of kilns. And uh, these, all they do, water will vaporize if you pull enough vacuum on it. Throw it in there, pull a good vacuum. You don't have to heat it, you have to do anything. It'll, it'll come out of there. They're very fast, but they don't have the same sort of problem that heating and pulling the air out, I mean the moisture out has. You won't have case hardening. You can pull it out as fast as you want. I thought, uh, you can't really see it. I, I was afraid we wouldn't be able to. It will do up to a thousand foot or foot capacity kiln now in this style. Can do up to 200,000 board feet uh, a year. Hey, Ricky, I read about that one time and it's also useful whenever you're drying really thick pieces of stock. Yeah, this is, this is the way to do that. Alright, well why a simple one, we just throw it in the attic. So, well, you, I've done that and it does work. <laughs> But you have to remember that different woods have optimum drying schedules. In other words, uh, oak will dry very differently from pine, will dry very differently from poplar as far as time in the same temperature and environment. But if you really want simple, all you have to do is solve this equation. <laughs> <laughs> all right, our plan, we're going to build a solar kiln as close as possible to the proven methods that other people have already done. We're not going to try to reinvent the wheel here. And a real good source of a whole lot of information about this is Virginia Tech and several other colleges, but Virginia Tech kind of really got all this started. When we build it, we're going to record the moisture content every day or so, a couple of days, depending on where we are in the process. And we're going to record the humidity <coughs> Vent position is these little slides I'm going to have on the windows on the back of the kiln, and I'm going to draw lines. All right, this is uh, the publication that I primarily uh, use for this. Uh, it's put out by Virginia Tech, as I mentioned. It's very good. This one, they have two publications. One, the first one they did was for a big kiln, uh, hold over a thousand board feet, and this one I think is for 500 or 600 or something like that. And uh, it's really basically this design. Good publication, though. All right, things, some of the elements you got to keep in mind when you're designing a kiln. Okay, the size of the collector, which is your glass on the front, or uh, what do you call that? Plex glass, or not plex glass either. It's, uh, that pl the clear plastic stuff. <coughs> I get what it's called now. Uh, for every square foot of that collector should be enough to dry 10 board feet of your lumber inside of there. If you keep that constant, then you're not going to overheat. That's what we're trying to accomplish here. That way we don't have to solve any equations or anything like that. 
We should be able to dry a load in about a month. And that's a load that's coming <coughs> out of the tree. The loads we're going to be putting in there are 12% already. And that should be a little more forgiving because all we've got to do is get it from 12 to 8, and I suspect it'll be less than a week. About how many board feet of load? We're getting there. Okay. <coughs> Does the outside right. temperature matter? I'm sorry? Does the outside temperature matter whether it's January or July? When you drive? Uh, we're getting there, too. <laughs> <laughs> the slope of the roof would be approximately the latitude of the location in the Wilbur, and that's 34 degrees. And up to 10 degrees above that, if you're going to use it a lot in the winter. Uh, I've kind of kicked around 45 for a long time because that's really close to 34. But I ended up going with 40, 40 degrees from the slope of my roof. So that will mean that I will be able to not have to worry so much in the summer of getting too hot. It won't be as efficient in the summer, which is okay with me. I don't want to be moving wood in the middle of the summer either. And, but it's more efficient in the winter which is six degrees above our optimal 40 degrees. I figure that's a good, happy medium. <laughs> the nice thing about a solar kiln, and the reason it works so well, is you have that overnight relax. So it'll get up the temperature, and for a couple hours after sunset, it'll still be pretty warm in there, but overnight it'll get all the way down to close to the overnight temperature but uh, it'll probably keep the moisture from the overnight from coming in and will let your wood relax a little bit. It'll kind of give it time for the more embedded water molecules to work their way to the outside again. Uh, we have a really good friend that has one of these and he does this for a living. He does flooring for a living. Remember my flooring thing? So he has to have it right before he sells that flooring. This is the only way he eats, and that's what the biggest thing he said was. It's very forgiving. You don't have to you don't have to be a scientist to do this. It, once you get the design right and get a feel for how it dries your wood, it's very easy. Very easy. You don't have to measure every day's temperature or anything like that. All right. This little. All right. This is a stack of the wood. In my case. This is a tad over 36 inches wide, about 40, but I gotta figure my separation between the boards. So I'm gonna figure three feet wide. The kiln is 14 feet long, so I can use 12 foot lumber. I have to keep a foot of separation all the way around, on the sides and on the ends. So I have good airflow around the stack. So my stack is 36 inches wide, basically. I can go up to 36 inches high. <clears throat> that don't mean I can do 36 rows of 1 inch 1 of lumber. Got to have my stickers. That's 19 rows of wood. So that's seven, right at 700 board feet. I figured I'm going to be able to put a little bit right here too. I think I can get 700 board feet in mine. So what do I need for my collector? Can't go over 70, okay? Also, a couple other neat things, or things you want to, it's a little difficult to see in my drawing. This baffle right here, all you're trying to do is keep the airflow going against the uh, collector to collect off that heat, bring it around to the front of the stack. This will be sealed off on the bottom, and we want it to go through the stack as much as we can, come back around, come back up here. Okay, you get the idea? This little piece of flat stuff here, it looks like it's different from the stack. We don't want direct sunlight on our wood. So we'll have to put some kind of plywood, tin, whatever we think of, so that our sunlight's not bleaching the top of the wood. Remember now, we're not going to put plain wood in here. We're going to put wood in here that needs to be plain. So probably we wouldn't hurt it anyway, but I think that's why they do that. All of the inside of the kiln has to be painted black. Even the, the wood supporting the uh, glass and everything, everything has to be painted black. And they gave a couple of nice options for doing it. This aluminum roof coating is not black, it's gray, but it would seal up any cracks or anything you have in your construction work. And I'm going to use OSP on the inside so it would seal up your OSP. Uh, but it's gray, you'll have to paint it black after you get through. 
Uh, this is actually uh, paint that's made for this thing. I imagine it's pretty expensive, but this is leak stopper is uh, something you can get at Home Depot and stuff like that. It's pretty, it's kind of rubberized paint. And there's a couple of other options out there now that uh, restore paint that you put on decks. I doubt that they sell it in black, but, but I haven't looked yet. And one more is uh, that liner stuff you put in truck bed liners. I know they sell that in a gallon, but I don't know if that may be too expensive for our use. I don't imagine it would take two or three gallons. But uh, the guy that uh, lives next to my aunt, he just used paint. And it, it looks like OSB painted. <laughs> it's fine. It doesn't have to look pretty. Ah, all right. This is an indicator, say, a go-to drawing. Hang on a second. All right. You know, I, mean, I got to use ketchup. All right, we're going to start, <clears throat> even though we're going to be on a trailer, I didn't draw the trailer, I didn't want to mess with it. We're going to put them on skids. So if we need to use that trailer for anything, we're just going to take Daddy's tractor and we're going to drag that thing off, support the end of it, put another support, we pull the trailer up some more, support the other end of it, drive off. Okay, so we can use this on the ground as much as we want to. Or, you know. All right, so the way I figured, when I grab it with the tractor, I don't want this thing seesawing. So I put two other 6x6s. Six six, these are 6x6s, six by, six, by the way. They're going to be pressure treated. <clears throat> two across the front and the back, even where the, uh, the framing is going to be for the ends. Uh, we're going to lap these That's ends right. so that it won't want a scissor. And we're going to screw the heck out of it. All right, then we put our floor sheathing. That's going to be OSP. All right. We'll just add the framing. Front wall framing, pretty simple. 30 inches, basically. All right, the back wall. All right, and that's a, this angle is 40 degrees. All right. Uh, after that, <coughs> after we do the framing, I was going to show you on the back. These are our louvers. There's your openings to control your temperature. You've got some on the top and on the bottom. On the top, you open them wider, it gets cooler. On the bottom, you get more airflow. It doesn't necessarily cool it off because it's still holding the, the heat. Okay? So your bottom's going to have like a little bit of adjustment. The top's a lot of adjustment. If you're getting too hot, you open them wide, you're going to cool it off real fast. Okay? Especially with that slope roof. Okay, all right, then we're going to add the sheathing on the inside. All right, remember we're going to seal them up as best we can. Oh, we forgot our insulation in the walls. We have to insulate the walls too. Then we're going to add the sheathing. We're going to use uh, as close as we can to cut the cut so that we got it sealed. But it's okay if it leaks a little bit, especially on the inside because don't forget we got that tie back on the outside. We don't care. Uh, <clears throat> and then the uh, the fan support, we have to build those. These have to come in from the inside 18 inches or thereabout. Not an exact measurement, but we don't want to be right next to the window. We want to have airflow still going by with that window open. Alright? And those fans can be anything. Okay, so and then on the bottom of that fan support, we're going to add our plastic, or it could be wood or whatever to fold up. Plastic, I figure, would be easier to tie up to keep it from the airflow going through the stack. We're going to use our uh, hardy plank on the outside. All right, on the back side, this was Dad and I had a lot of trouble with this. Uh, how are we going to do such a wide opening and be able to get it open? So, I actually found some online that did the same thing. And this is six, uh, 14 feet wide, so you can't build a 14 foot door that swings very easy. So we're going to put a center door that's removable, but doesn't swing. It's just going to be able to have handles on the side, and we'll just be able to take it loose at the top and bottom and just move it out of the way. And then the other doors, 
will swing. Okay, and there's our louvers at the bottom. These frames around it is going to have a board on it. We'll slide in a slide, then we'll draw lines, and we'll number them. So we can keep an idea how much do we have to keep airflow in there to maintain the temperature. If you don't have, <clears throat> if say you load it up and you only have 250 board feet of lumber, it's going to get hotter. So you have to have the ability to adjust your kiln. If for, for, a given, for a given capacitor, would, would you think your slider would be in the same place? Uh, it would definitely have to change. For the whole load or would it change? For the whole load. The first, but would it change during the drying cycle also? Yeah, it would. I would think it would. What you're going to do for sure, remember those <coughs> test pieces in there? For sure, this is the most important thing to monitor is how fast that moisture is coming down. And I've got a formula for that in those publications for how fast do you want it to come down at what humidity level for to be safe. That has got to be right. But that is not something that changes in one day. You know what I'm saying? It, I've got a little time to figure out when do I need to make a change, when do I need to make a change. And we'll get a feel for that. I'm hoping. But remember now, I don't need 700 board feet of dried lumber at a time. So I suspect we'll be using this partially filled pretty often. I, I don't want to dry my wood, you know, a year and a half before I'm going to use it. I want to dry it pretty close to when I'm going to use it. You know, I want it to be 7% when I play with it. So what else do we have to cover here? What size fans are you putting in there? Because you have pictures of having a big house fan. 14 inch. Alright, that's it. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed it.